Open my eyes that I may see. Glimpses of truth you have for me. Place in my hands a wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Amen. Relationships change and stay the same. I have a daughter who is 13 now. And I can remember getting her dressed and tying her shoes and reading books to her at night. Our relationship was one of constant and practical care. But now that she is 13, I have very little to say about her wardrobe or her taste in books or TV shows or boyfriends. We used to talk about My Little Pony, but now we talk about Algebra 1 and drama class and cross-country cleats. Relationships in order to continue must be dynamic. Of course, it's not all change all the time. Our relationship has continued all of these years because it is a relationship between a father and a daughter. It is unchanging, in fact, that I will always be her father. What changes is how I will father and how she will daughter. <laughs> Relationships are built on commitment, stability, but also dynamism, some sense of continuity, but also discontinuity. There is always a mix of security, but risk. Individuals, not just relationships, also ne negotiate this balance of stability and change as we develop across the lifespan. We may look back on ourselves from previous errors as a child or a young adult and see certain aspects of our personalities that have always been there and other aspects that have changed dramatically over the years. Society changes by making great advances, yet stays the same by groups always seeming to struggle over power. Technology changes and stays the same. We as humans have been writing for several thousand years now. We've just been doing it with different instruments. We seem to weave our understandings of people and society out of the cloth of adaptability, transformation, evolution, change, and routine, and predictability stability. But you know what we don't like to change? God. We use metaphors of unchangeability for God. God is a rock, a mighty fortress, a strong tower, inanimate objects, right, that have no life, that are incapable of moving. We even sing there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. We are familiar with this common and beautiful understanding of God. It even has a fancy theological name, immutable. The immutability of God. I try that out on Dr. Craig Snell sometime when he's here. The immutability of God. The reformed tradition some of us are a part of captures this characteristic of God in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It says, God is a spirit whose being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth are infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. And of course, there are biblical passages that speak of this quality of God. The writer of the book of Hebrews puts the formulation in terms of Jesus by saying Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We prefer our God to be stable with no shadow of turning. So what a scandal it 
it must be to know the God of the Exodus story. Because change is precisely what Moses asks God to do in our story in Exodus 32. The Israelites are camped at Mount Sinai. Moses has received the two tablets which contain the Ten Commandments. But Moses was so long on the mountain that the people down below have concocted an idea and they have pitched it to Aaron. Perhaps we can make our own God to worship. Because clearly Moses has left us. I mean, where is he? I haven't seen him in days. It is a preposterous idea. It is a slap in the face of God. God who liberated these captives just chapters before, right, is now becoming an idol, a golden calf. So they construct this bowl of gold from their jewelry. And they get so carried away and proud of their golden statue that they build an altar and they declare a festival. Now isn't that the human condition? Our ability to run headlong into giant messes. Our ability to be saved by God one moment only to complain and murmur in another moment. Our ability to worship God, a God who liberates us only to have the leadership disappear for a few days. And what are we doing? We turn to idolatry. When God responds to this development, God is naturally aggravated by the situation. These are stiff-necked people, God says. They can't wait even a few days without their leader before they are constructing idols. So God tells Moses something fascinating. Did you catch it? God says, let me be. Leave me alone and let my anger burn. Let me destroy them. That's what I'll do. Here is the God we are accustomed to in the Old Testament. Many of us have walking around an angry, destructive, punishing God. Here is the God we often wrestle with and reject. The type of God that leads to sermons about sinners in the hands of an angry God. God is angry and ready to destroy all of Israel. Start over again, perhaps just like in the great flood, except without Noah, this time with Moses as the leader. The new Noah. Noah. But notice how Moses responds to God. God says, let me be, leave me alone. And Moses says, I won't let you be. I won't leave you alone. Just as Jacob wrestles with in the night for a blessing, Moses will not allow God's anger to win the day. Do not let your anger burn, O oh God. Moses engages God in a conversation and issues three commands to God, which are usually watered down in our English translations. Translation, translators grow uncomfortable here, for we have entered into treacherous theological territory. The first command, God says, is, tr translators usually say, turn, turn, God, for surely it is acceptable for God to turn. But the Hebrew uses a word that means repent. Scandalous, isn't it? A God who might repent. And then Moses issues a second command. Translators usually use a word like renounce, or perhaps God can renounce something. But the Hebrew word means to regret, to be sorry, to change one's mind. We have entered into shaky theological ground with this word. A God who regrets, a God who changes God's mind, a 
And then the third command. Well, the third command, the translators usually momentarily forget their orthodoxy, and they use the word remember. When they could have chosen probably a milder, softer word like, you know, call to mind or recall, why don't you God? But they use the word remember. Because God surely doesn't need to remember. Does God? Repent. Change your mind. Remember. What an interesting demand, Brother Moses. What an interesting way to think of God. So what is the result of Moses' shocking demands? Well, God chooses the middle verb there. The narrator says that God changes God's mind. God regrets. The story concludes with the narrator's very simple observation that God regrets the punishment that God had planned for Israel. God nahams nun chet mem. God decides not to destroy God's people. God repents of the evil that God has done. The verb is clear. Change is on the way. Today I'm less interested in this ultimate question of God's immutability. If you read the commentaries, by the way, on this passage, you'll find all sorts of nuanced theological expositions defending God's unchanging nature in the face of the plain sense of the text. They will call attention to the fact that God's will perhaps was not initially completely set in stone at the beginning, right? So that God was sort of thinking through various possibilities and had not reached a final decision. I sort of picture God as a contestant on who wants to be a millionaire, right? God hasn't quite said final answer yet, right? Just sort of mulling over the possibilities that might happen. Perhaps that is one way to protect God's immutability. But I'm less interested in this theological question because I am more interested in why the author of Exodus has the freedom and the audacity to tell us straightforward that God changes God's mind. The author of Exodus, I would wager, is less concerned about Greek philosophical notions of the divine immutability. Doesn't sound like a Hebrew word at all. And the author of Exodus is more concerned to show us a relationship. God is in relationship with these people, and these people are in relationship with God. So, when people replace God with a statue of gold, a relational God gets angry about this broken relationship. And, in relationship, ultimately, God changes God's mind. And notice that it is in the direction of mercy. God chooses relationship over rightness. God chooses covenant over condemnation. God chooses to listen to Moses, to be influenced by Moses, to respond to God's people. The God of Israel, the God of Moses, chooses mercy over punishment. This, my friends, is the God of the Old Testament that you are not accustomed to. And yet, I would say, this is the very heart of the God of the Old Testament. A God who establishes relationships with a community of people. A God who maintains that relationship despite the crazy actions of this community of people. So what are we to make of this scandalous story about a relational God who shows mercy? How are we to live in light of a God who changes God's mind? Let me suggest this morning in closing 
that we too might just be called to imitate this God. We too might be called to move from our places of enacting punishment to places that show mercy. We might be called to choose relationship with God and each other over rightness. We might be called to change our minds. What do you need to change your mind about? Changing our minds is not a sign of weakness. It's not being wishy-washy. It's a sign of growth to change your mind. To be willing to lay aside who you were in order to be who you uh, might be. And guess what? You are here today, on this Wednesday, in this amazing space called Seminary, to work on just this, changing your mind. As we begin this new semester, perhaps we are being called to change, to let go of some old behaviors, to be open to the future, to be open to change, Friends, if God can change, maybe, just maybe, we can too.